uh, chapter 12 of Luke, verses 43, 49 to 53. And we're going to break it down just a little bit today to look at some of the pieces here. There's kind of three pieces to the scripture. The first part is that our Lord saying that he has come to set the earth on fire and how he wishes it's already burning. I oftentimes get talk to young people. I tell them, uh, stop trying to be cool. There are so many cool people in the world that the world has grown cold. I said, only dead bodies and fish are cool. <laughs> Everything must, God ever said, blessed are the cool. Our Lord doesn't call us to coolness. He calls us to be on fire. And that fire is the love of the Holy Spirit. I actually tell them that uh, uh, Jesus said, if you're cool, lukewarm, which is cool, I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. So I said, if you want to be vomit, then go ahead and be cool, because in the end, you're just going to be vomit. <laughs> so I tell them, don't try to be vomit, don't try to be cool, but be on fire. And the fire that our Lord is talking about here is that fire of the Holy Spirit, that gift of love of God that he's going to share with us. That once we come into the waters of baptism, we receive all the graces of baptism into that state of grace. Then the Holy Spirit comes down upon us in that and allows our hearts to truly become the sanctuary of the Most High. Where we truly become persons of love, persons of dignity, persons who understand what it is to be loved by God. And then in experiencing that burning love of God in our own hearts, it sets us on fire. And that allows us to then go forth and bring others into that fire of God's love. Uh, a priest friend of mine would always say, get so close to the heart of Christ, the sacred heart of Jesus, that the fire that burns in his heart would set you on fire. <laughs> and so we want to be consumed in that true fire of our Lord Jesus Christ, which should really motivate us to be living, uh, first of all, a life of virtue and holiness, and then secondly, being able to then uh, spread that fire everywhere, that we should set this world ablaze. Now, the Lord goes on to say, there's a baptism which I must be baptized, and how great is my anguish until it is accomplished. And we know here he's referring to the passion, right? That he's in anguish in waiting for his passion. Perhaps that word anguish might be misinterpreted to mean that the Lord is experiencing anxiety, worry, fear of his passion. And the opposite is actually true. His anguish comes from his desire, his thirst, his want to give his life for love of us. Um, he said at the Last Supper, and it's mentioned in Luke's Gospel, just before the Last Supper, long have I desired to eat this meal with you. And we know that the Last Supper is the initiating of the Passion, where he offers himself in the Holy Eucharist, which then proceeds on to the offering of himself on Calvary. But he is desirous to give himself in the Eucharist, which means what? He's desirous of the passion. He's desirous to offer himself for love of us. When did God decide that he would die for us? Was it when our first parents fell? No. He knows all things. He knew they were going to fall when he created them. He gave them free will. <laughs> and so he foreknew that they would do that. So even before the Lord said, let there be light, God chose not only to become man, but God had already chosen to give his life for love of us. That's why in the garden, uh, when our first parents fall and the Lord condemns Lucifer and tells him that he'll have hatred, enmity between the woman and uh, her seed, uh, and they will crush his head, it's because our Lord had already had the remedy for sin prepared. So his uh, anxiousness, his anguish, is a thirsting for, a desire for, where he would be able to give his life for love of us. So we have the first part, the Lord wanted to set the world on fire. The second part is his anguish and desire, his thirsting to offer himself in sacrifice. And the third part here is the division that our Lord came to bring. He says, do you think that I've come to establish peace on earth? And my first response would be, yeah, aren't you the prince of peace, right? Why aren't you bringing peace? You're the prince of peace. Right, but the peace he's come to give is not the world's peace. And he says that in John's Gospel. Uh, my peace I give to you, but not as the world gives peace do I give it. The peace he's come to give is peace between ourselves and the Father. To reconcile humanity with God. To reconcile us with him. Peace comes from entering into the state of grace. Now once we enter into that state of grace, we have peace with God. And then we are to establish peace with one another by living the second commandment of love one another. And so the Lord does call us 
into the peaceful relationship between ourselves and the Father and God, but also in peace with one another and how we are to live in this world. However, the reality is that when the Lord comes and gives himself the love of us and we commit ourselves and we respond to that love, there will be those who will use their free will to say, no, I'm not going to follow you, Lord, who will actually have a hatred for virtue. Anyone who is caught in vice and captured in a life of vice and doesn't want out of that vice or is afraid of getting out of that vice or is bearing the guilt so deeply of their vice that they have a certain hatred for uh, the faith. And we see that Lord told us that. If they persecuted me, they'll persecute you, he told us. He told us, blessed are you when you're persecuted for the sake of righteousness. He didn't say if, he said when. <laughs> you're persecuted, you're going to be. And he said that this division is just not going to be a division uh, among groups in the world, but it'll go to the very family. How many times we hear stories of parents who children won't speak to them because the children have rejected the faith. Or we have children who accepted the faith and the parents stand against them because they've accepted the faith. We see how faith has really divided families terribly. It divides husband and wife at times when the husband or the wife decides to live a life of virtue and holiness and the other spouse rejects it with vehemence, it causes division. And it happens with children and so forth. So everything our Lord prophesied here came to pass. Think about someone like St. Francis of Assisi when he decided to follow Christ. His father locked him in the basement for months. Locked him in the basement. Or Thomas Aquinas, uh, when he was visiting with his mother and his brother, uh, his brothers locked him in a room and sent a prostitute into his room in order to uh, get him to try to leave the monastery. And he jumps out the window and runs back uh, to, the, uh, to the priory. Must have been a big window because Thomas Aquinas was very fat. Uh, <laughs> it's a little unknown fact. <laughs> However, uh, we see this division all over the place um, in, in many of the stories of the saints. When they decided to embrace the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, they faced this type of division. And so, in putting it all together, our Lord comes to set the world afire with his love. That fire is going to be set by the gift of his passion by the offering of himself, uh, by the acceptance of the baptism that he's about to receive. And that's going to ignite the hearts of many and set them on fire with love for him, which is going to bring about the division because there will be those who reject the gospel. So we take that centerpiece first. Our Lord comes to offer himself in sacrificial love for us. And when we behold that love of Christ, we behold that cross, we behold this beautiful uh, God who loved us on to death and sets our hearts on fire with the fire of His love for us, and then we want to live that fire, we want to live that life of God, live that love for God, which then will bring about division and family and cause the problem we have. Um, and it's not easy to have to go with our Lord to the cross sometimes, feeling that persecution from family, persecution from friends, persecution from those who will not accept the faith which is why we need to be willing to drink of the same chalice our Lord drank from, as he said to both James and John, right? Um, so today we ask our Lord Jesus Christ for serving graces. First of all, the grace to know in our hearts the depth of his divine love. To know in our hearts the depth of, of that gift of himself on the cross, the depth of his desire and thirst that we should be with him forever in heaven. We receive that beautiful thirsting for God that it becomes like a burning fire within our hearts uh, that just, we just want to immerse ourselves in that fire of divine love. And from that, to truly live in this world, despite any persecution or suffering we may face, even from our closest relatives, to stand strong and firm and do everything we can to bring our relatives or friends or whoever may have rejected the gospel around us to do Lord, give us that grace to bring them into that fire of love, to understand the beauty of the cross, understand the divine love of God, so that they too may be able to share in the joy that comes from knowing our Lord Jesus Christ and the depth of his love for us. So may the Lord set our hearts afire as we contemplate the mystery of his love so that we might be able to share it with others, that those who reject the gospel might come to accept it, receive it, and there might be truly peace in their hearts as they're reconciled to God, knowing His divine love. May God bless you, America.